Well, hello, everyone. I'm so happy to welcome everyone together for this very special ASU laser on Seize the Moment, how we are seizing the moment with our most creative interdisciplinary research projects that we're privileged to offer seed grant funding to, together with our partners from Leonardo, from uh, the Humanities Lab and Global Futures Lab. We're in great hands today with uh, the fellow organizers, coordinators, and really the visionaries who are carrying out this uh, highly creative and hybrid, impactful scholarship and research projects. Just a word about Leonardo. We are the International Society of Arts, Science, Technology, and we are fostering a more regenerative, just and vibrant world at this nexus of art, science and technology. We do this with our publications, with MIT Press, our programs and our partnerships, including our singular partnership with Arizona State University. So I'm gonna welcome everyone here and pass it over, uh, but thank you so much for sharing this time together and continue to inspire us all. All right, I will jump in next. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenny Strickland, and I am the program coordinator for Leonardo at ASU. I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to have all of our wonderful panelists and our attendees in the room. Um, I am based in Tempe, Arizona, and I'm really excited that you can all join us for this LASER. For those that don't know, LASER stands for Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. It may be evening where you are, it may be mm -hmm. just afternoon, um, but we welcome the spirit of this exchange with our colleagues from all over. Um, and I just wanted to really quickly put in the chat, once I'm able to, the link to join our future lasers. They take place in 52 cities across the globe around a myriad of topics, and they're all really interesting. So I do invite you to join as you are interested and able. Um, and with that, I will pass it back over to Bree. And I'm actually gonna welcome Sally to introduce herself and seize the moment. Hello, everyone. I'd like to add my welcome. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, these inspiring uh, researchers together to talk about their work and the progress and to have attentive li listeners uh, to enjoy what they have to say. Uh, this, these uh, seed grants that we're going to be talking about today are a product of a collaboration, uh, as Diana mentioned, between Leonardo the Humanities Lab at ASU and the Global Futures Lab at ASU. And we it is the culmination really of a two-year project that we called Seize the Moment. Uh, even though the moment that we're in keeps changing, <laughs> we have recognized that the problems that we face, the challenges, even the crises that we face are interconnected and that the very same roots uh, are leading to some of the challenges uh, that we need to address. And so Seize the Moment is designed to bring together uh, environmental questions along with social justice questions. And because we're still in a pandemic <clears throat> with all the implications of that, health questions that challenge us at this moment. And so these researchers, you'll whom you'll be hearing from, have taken to heart the fact that these crises are interrelated and proposed projects that address them in very creative ways, using the humanities, uh, science, technology, the arts, uh, whatever tools are necessary to help us understand where we need to go to address these challenges. So enjoy what you're about to hear. Uh, I look forward to the discussion. Back to Bree. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bree, and I'm the public engagement uh, coordinator for the Seize the Moment initiative. Um, 
And thank you to Diana and Sally, um, co-directors of the Seize the Moment Initiative, and then also to Jenny um, for being here today. Um, and I'm really excited to hear everyone talk about their projects. Um, as Sally mentioned, um, this is our second year of seed grants. And so um, we have four new wonderful projects that are going to present today. Um, not everyone from each team is here, although there are representatives from each of those teams to talk to you about what they've been working on. Um, and as we move through the presentations, if anyone has questions or thoughts that they want to share, please feel free to um, put those into the chat. And then we'll be doing a Q&A towards the end of the session in which we can take a look at those a little closer. Um, as I mentioned, there's going to be four groups, um, and we have the lovely Rachel Bowditch here to, uh, with us today, mm -hmm. um, who's going to be facilitating us through um, these four talks. Um, I think uh, important to note that Rachel um, is actually uh, one of our prior seed grant um, awardees. Uh, her and her team were in our first round. Um, and so it's just really exciting to welcome someone back into this space um, who we have been working with over the, the last year. Um, so without further ado, I want to welcome Rachel to kind of take over the ship. And um, if anyone <laughs> needs anything, please let please let me know. And I'm going to drop a link right now to Rachel's project Anthropocene into the chat. So if you want to check that out, um, yeah, that'd be great. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, again, my name is Rachel Bowditch. I'm a professor in the School of Music, Dance and Theater. Um, I'm a theater director. Um, and as Bree said, I was a recipient of the Seized a Moment grant with Stephen Bachelos and Karen Jean Martinson for a project called Anthropocene, which is a 90 minute uh, performance uh, that, in, that examines the escalation of consumption and consumerism and sort of the environmental impacts of that, uh, which opens November 3rd. So hopefully you all can come see that. Uh, I just wanted to say that the Seized a Moment grant really was a catalyst for this project. Uh, and really jump-started um, the project in exciting ways. So I'm very excited to hear about these new projects um, and, and sort of the, the ideation stage and where it's all going. Um, so we have four projects today. Um, we're gonna be hearing from AI Mediated Refugee Project first, then Community Visions, then Taste of the State, Taste of State 48, and then Haikus Transmuting Ecological Grieving into Action. So each group will have 15 minutes and I'm gonna allow each group to just introduce themselves and their team members um, and to share what they would like about their projects uh, with each other. And then we'll have a Q and A. Uh, so start collecting questions of each other. We'll start with questions of each other and then we'll open it up to a larger group. So um, without further ado, let's begin with our, our first group, the AI Mediated Refugee Project. So. Who would like to introduce themselves first? Sarah. Hi, it is so such a pleasure to be here. So my name is Sarah Bassett. I am a professor of practice in the School of Public Affairs, and I am also a practicing urban planner. I am working with Nicholas Polarski and Surin Jaya Saraya. If you can both please introduce yourselves, and then I'll get into our presentation. Uh, yes, I'm a Surin Jaya Surya. I'm a professor in arts, media, and engineering, and electrical, computer, and energy engineering. I generally work on computer vision and visual computing technologies, including artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, my name is Nicholas Polarski. I'm an associate professor uh, in the Sydney Portier New American Film School, as well as arts, media, and engineering. Uh, my focus is uh, interactive, uh, creating interactive media, uh, whether that be AR, VR, or XR, and how those things can work into uh, increased public discourse. So our project is really looking at bringing together these three very diverse fields. And so just to start in terms of some of the background from, I am really a social scientist, um, urban planner. I work a lot with disasters and communities in crisis, particularly that community resilience piece. And we really started looking at this issue from policy planning and sort of the nonprofit perspective in terms of how we use narrative and personal story for the ways we talk about really big problems that impact society. So of course, some big ones, institutional racism, climate change, things like housing insecurities, uh, these issues often in a narrative form, particularly as we think about 
policy and really driving action are often viewed through a very singular lens. And so one where a personal story maybe is not treated as systemic or broad, but as we all know, they are very systemic and very broad. And so intersectionality was something that is really important to each of us um, and as a way to address some of the, the things and issues that we're talking about under this umbrella of the syndemic. And so from the social scientist perspective, we know that these are deeply and inherently connected, right? Housing insecurity leads to health disparities, uh, exacerbates economic insecurities, spatial injustices lead to historicized environmental injustices, right? We're seeing this with climate refugee communities. Um, these This disproportionately impacts uh, vulnerabilities for children, aging individuals, civil unrest, crime rates. And so the question we really looked at was this concept of the built environment as an extension of the way we create narrative in um, our, our spaces and the decisions we make from this policy perspective. And so part of this, and, and we got a little bit into the philosophy of this, which I won't get into all of that detail now, but uh, we, we relied on a couple of different thinkers in this space to think about narrative in the built environment. Um, and then what does that mean when we talk about data and the way data is used and the way we think about policy level changes? One argument can be that data is narrative and it's our new form of storytelling, whether we really see this or not. And so we really wanted to think about if we rely heavily on using data to shape how society is formed, what does that mean to the way we think about these issues from an intersectionality perspective, um, particularly one where traditional narratives, as we understand them, are really evolving in terms of the way we communicate and really help drive different planning policy level decisions for things under this syndemic of um, multiple crises that are occurring. And so we're really interested in different types of emerging technologies as a way to reorient how we're connecting to our urban environments as a way to help create and drive different types of change in that sort of policy planning perspective. And so where emerging technologies are what we call reconstituting the body's relationship to the built form um, as a way to really challenge some of the notions of our future in this space. And so I wanna hand it over to Nick to talk a little bit about why we are looking at AI as a way to think through the storytelling piece. Yeah, so one of the best ways in order to do this and think about the body in the, in the built form is the bodies that actually don't exist in the built forms that occupy uh, centers of power in general. So uh, we're really interested in kind of developing uh, AI uh, uh, characters, stories um, in the ways that we think about documentary film uh, or the way that we think about documentaries in general, but how can we make a, a mediated experience and, and bring conversation in, in uh, domains of society that don't necessarily have it? Now, when we do this, we have a very difficult uh, problem that we run into is like, well, how do you do this? Um, uh, and it's just as important to develop the technology with the community um, as it is to develop the technology itself. So here's something that we're really looking at in terms of process. Uh, we want to build this AI engine, uh, co-created with the community, build it from the ground up, uh, uh, work as a process, not necessarily as a project, um, and then create some sort of AI uh, engine uh, with uh, the refugee communities that we're working with that uh, that they have civic buy-in, they have governance in the process of making uh, uh, such a thing, uh, because that will inevitably be mediating their stories. Um, and so uh, we thought, what if AI is kind of built uh, from the ground up? Um, so in order to do so, uh, uh, we decided uh, that we would begin to, to have conversations uh, with various refugee communities, because the refugee communities experience the syndemic um, uh, uh, probably more so than most folks uh, due to instability, uh, due to being uh, forced uh, forced migration. Um, uh, there's a lot of touch points there. Um, so what we decided to do is think uh, less broadly. We thought, you know, AI has this idea that it's going to take all of the information in the world and then uh, make it to one kind of clarifying or calcifying uh, uh, point. What we decided to do is think about, well, what if we developed um, uh, uh, an AI uh, that someone could talk to that was developed with the community and uh, was trained on the subjectivity of that community? Um, so uh, if you could go to the next slide. 
Uh, so many, many of you are now familiar with uh, ChatGPT uh, and OpenAI, and ChatGPT is probably the most, uh, one of the most advanced uh, and compelling conversational agents uh, currently uh, out there. Um, uh, and this uh, uses a large language model um, uh, trained on an enormous cor corpa uh, 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 of data scraped from the internet. Um, uh, and the model has some serious ethical and bias concerns, uh, largely due to its over-reliance on statistical patterns uh, and uh, the large breadth of data. So what it ends up doing is it kind of just creates a lot of generic answers, um, uh, but we're interested primarily in specificity. Um, so in order to do that, uh, uh, what we decided to do is there's this fantasy uh, of narrative AI, which it kind of creates a totality of truth. Uh, and we want to deviate from that, actually. We want to try to think about really subjective AI that tells the subjective, nuanced stories of people. Um, so this is uh, what we're aiming to do. Um, uh, so uh, we're kind of doing the opposite of, of, of uh, chat GPT. Uh, we're trying to work with the community, uh, create um, a, a large uh, work with them to create uh, data sets uh, in which um, uh, the AI can be trained on uh, that they approve. So it's not kind of drawing from the entirety of the internet. It's actually uh, would be similar to selecting aspects or libraries that are approved by the community, um, but also ingesting their stories in the process. So how this will end up working uh, is uh, we will uh, interview, you'll go up to a, a screen uh, and that screen will uh, uh, have a uh, simulated avatar of of this person. Um, we we decided on a simulated avatar because I, a lot of refugees actually uh, aren't able to tell their stories uh, due to the fact uh, that they, they that they need to be obfuscated um, uh, uh, visually because of legal ramifications. So the refugee communities that we've been working with are very afraid actually of being on camera with their exact likeness uh, simply because. Uh, they're afraid that there are uh, going to be ramifications by simply just being shown, uh, which is which is really serious. Uh, so what we're going to do is create kind of likenesses of of a specific person or character. Um, they will select the data points, and then we'll also interview uh, and have a large uh, database of their stories, uh, their individual personal story. So when you walk up to this uh, screen and you ask a question, it will pull up a video file. Uh, of that person giving you a response. So you can say, you know, how are you? Uh, and they say, doing fine, doing okay. Uh, or tell me about your hometown that you, um, uh, that you uh, immigrated from. And then they would give you a response. Um, the questions uh, that we're training on is selected again by the community. And then uh, what we inevitably will end up doing is working with the community to prioritize specific answers over others. Um, so, and uh, uh, Soren will explain uh, how actually the system works uh, deeply. Yes. So, um, to talk a little bit about the technology underlying it, and I apologize in this time frame we don't have a time to show like a demo of our prototype. Though we did demonstrate an early version on of a prototype at the Center for Documentary Studies uh, at Duke. Um, so, when we talk about AI, AI is not a monolithic term. Even though, if you look at most writing and journalists writing, they lump everything in terms of AI. What we think of as our artificially intelligent system is a system that is designed to understand what the user is querying for or what kind of topics they are interested and to match that to the appropriate video or video response from the interview that was pre-recorded with the um, the co-creator, uh, with the, the refugee. Um, and if not, to then let the system mediate and ask for clarifying questions or to follow up to help do an engagement. Because one could just place all the video files into a list and click to play, but that is not the type of engagement that we want, we envision users to have with the end system. We would like the, the system to help uh, shape the narrative um, uh, uh, and allow the user to ask questions uh, with a, uh, a speech interface. So we have the user input, it's spoken, and then it gets translated into uh, basically speech to text using kind of off the shelf tools. And then we go through a process called word embedding, which I'm gonna talk about next. Um, it gets led to an artificial neural network that determines what is the topic the person is talking about, which is actually a kind of a difficult task. It involves 
understanding natural language processing and context. And from that, it decides whether to play a video or to do a conversational agent. So in the next slide here, uh, we're showing here what a word embedding does. What a word embedding does is it represents people's speech or, or, or words they use into a natural, what's called a vector space of, or an information space. It's a mathematical representation that allows the computer to understand what is the relationship between different food words versus travel versus uh, you know uh, semantics or other types of semantic relationships between words. So we use kind of off the shelf word embeddings that are being used in models like chat GPT or other large language models. We also leverage this word embedding. Um, and also I should note that this is a place where bias issues can arise, which is why it's important that we're using our own training data. And we're not, um, we're trying to control um, if you train on a large corporate, hidden implicit bias and hidden assumptions can leak into your model. Uh, next slide, please. So the actual neural network is, this is the core of what's caused the so and so-called deep learning revolution since 2012, run on modern graphics processing units, GPUs. Uh, these neural networks can take in the mathematical representation of the word or the series of words corresponding to the user query and output what that tag is. Um, next slide, please. And kind of what's key, so from that tag, we can play a video, but the real like technological challenge is what happens if we don't have the exact video for a user's query? What do we do? We don't want to just report an error or be like, sorry, we don't have the video. We want to have the system engage the user to ask them to follow up with another question or to actually respond if it's a more factual question. And so we use something called a transformer model. This is what's underlying a lot of those large language models where it looks at the context between the different words used to be able to uh, respond. We also train this conversational agent on a corpus of documents about the home country of the participant so that it can actually answer factual questions like what is the, um, even things like Jeopardy style questions like what is the capital of this country or some basic factual questions the um, system can answer. And we want to note that the system is not trying to impersonate the person, that's very important. It'll be very clear to the user when the system responds versus when it's playing the actual, um, uh, the recorded narrative from the person, even if it is obfuscated by the virtual avatar and protected due to privacy reasons, it'll be very clear to the user that it's the AI system is meant to mediate, not to have a conversation with the user, but to mediate conversation of the user with the electronic digital avatar recorded from the interview um, in place. Now, I think that's uh, all we have uh, in the technological side. I would say that this is a work in progress and we're working on refining the parts and um, uh, conducting the interviews and going forward. But th this technology, we're very aware of the bias and um, you know ethical considerations of using this technology and we're we're investigating ways to ensure that there's transparency in the model outputs and that it does not give responses that are harmful to either the user or to the participant's story. And the co-creation process is meant to help be a check against that. Thank you so much. And one of the other points that we're looking to investigate as well are the attitudinal type changes that might be addressed through various visibility studies of this type of platform. And so we're sort of considering that long-term uh, piece and how that might influence um, other sort of conversations in this uh, a, a conversation around uh, climate change and other syndemic issues and refugee the refugee community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that was exactly 15 minutes. You guys timed it perfectly. <laughs> um, all right, without further ado, let's move on to the next group, Community Visions. So uh, I would like to have that, that group introduce themselves and their team and um, take it away. Community Visions. Thank you. Okay, I will share my screen. Hopefully that looks good. It's not my email. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead and get us started, Zoe. 
yeah, well, here we are. We're meeting virtually from the occupied homelands, the Yakima Otham, Peeposh, Yapapai, and Ende peoples, among others, including the 22 federally recognized tribes in Arizona, as well as some other unrecognized nations. So most of you probably know the, pl the place that we're meeting on as the Salt River Valley or the Ancacamo. So I want to tell you a story about it. It'll be sure, I promise. <laughs> There's a river that flows to the heart of a great valley and feeds the single greatest concentration of plants, animals, and peoples in a long desert. But stories like rivers have twists, and this one is no exception. As a river flows to the arms of other rivers and eventually to the sea, it faces many challenges along the way. Dams, diversion canals, wildfires, mines, new and strange species on its banks, and those who live there have to navigate these twists and turns too. We're excited to tell our story about how we've kind of gone this journey through, towards understanding this landscape through gameplay and storytelling. So hi, here's an actual introduction. I'm Zoe, I'm an eco-artist and an under, uh, sorry, excuse me, an undergraduate student of environmental science here at ASU West Campus. Uh, I create art about the Snoring Desert, its people, its rivers. I think it's pretty neat. And Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Clark. I'm a plant community ecologist and project manager for Earth System Science for the Anthropocene, which is a graduate scholars network through the Global Futures Lab that's aimed at acknowledging diverse ways of knowing beyond Western science, um, centering diversity, equity, and inclusivity, and also justice in our research. One of the things that we often forget to think about is what are the approaches that center justice? And what might that look like, as well as solving problems of the Anthropocene, Anthropocene, I, I don't know how, how are we pronouncing it? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say it your way, Rachel, in the Anthropocene. Um, I met Zoe through our research experiences for undergraduate students program just last summer in 2022. And she came to us with an interest um, in, in river ecology, but also in helping us rethink and relearn what we understand about the local river, the salt river that flows, flows through Phoenix Valley. Um, and she had a particularly interesting background in both ecology and art, you know, primarily as an artist and then now as an ecologist with her environmental science uh, major. So she joined our team along with Savage Cree Hess, who's another um, scholar in the program, to explore the relationship between humans and the environment with an emphasis on deconstructing the historic narratives around indigenous peoples as disappearing as gone people of the valley, right? And so this diverse team has emerged after lots of different field trips to really incredible places. Um, and and now kind of our focal team with the Seize the Moment grant, we work with Beckett Sterner, the PI. He's a philosopher, an assistant professor in Bio and Society program. Uh, Jennifer Kehi, who's a sociologist in the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences. That's me. Uh, Savage Great Hats is a molecular biologist. He just started his master's program here. Um, Nancy Grimm, who's a regents professor and a stream and urban ecologist. There's Zoe from far away, um, who's an eco artist. Uh, Arshon Casares, who just joined our group. She's a social justice and human rights undergraduate student. And Michelle, Michelle Hale, who's in the Office of American Indian Studies, I'm sorry, who's in the, the School of American Indian Studies and is a professor there. So we have this kind of growing and changing team, but we all come to this space with this acknowledgement that we share a core value and that's trying to find space for revitalizing a story that hasn't often been told in the Valley. So we came together with an understanding that the colonization of the Ankh Akamel, which is the Akmal Otham way of saying Salt River, has left deep wounds on the river and its people. Um, so for example, some of our teammates, Jorge Nadari, uh, use narrative analyses to uncover and amplify stories around damming, irrigation control, the effects of historic canals and the top-down effects of, of water management and control, the politics of water control in the valley. Um, we know that this divestation of water, especially through um, the Lower Salt River, is has created a maze of dams, canals, and urban sprawl. Um, the divestation of water has affected the Ottoman and Peeposh farms, agricultural farms that led to displacement, dispossession, poverty, and starvation. And a vanishing and eroding river in many ways. Um, oftentimes when we talk about the, the river, people kind of laugh, like what river, right? You know, what qualifies as a river if in so many spaces there's not water in it? So you might recognize that the story is a little bit different than the one that you're probably told in grade school. Uh, and I think the way that we construct narratives about the river really reveals our historical richness with it. Yeah, like like Michelle said, it's like the river, like if you say, oh, there's a river in, in Phoenix, like <laughs> some people don't even know it's there. 
uh, described as like very, very rich, de depleting, disappearing, vanishing. And we use a lot of that same language to describe many indigenous peoples, including the Yakima, Otham, the people of the river and uh, other, yeah, others as well. So damming really paved the way for the river and its communities to become fragmented, but that's not where the story ends. Despite these injustices, the communities of the river are alive and well. Victories such as the fight against Orm Dam and the Arizona Wild Settlement Act tell really vibrant counter stories in the face of dominant narratives that erase and marginalize them. But still the wounds of colonization remain, many of which are now inherited by indigenous youth. Yes, so the issues of cultural erasure, environmental degradation, and language loss are often interlinked, and it may seem that these problems are too complex to solve, yet small streams become big rivers. So one steps towards revitalizing the connection between contemporary Indigenous communities in the river is to co-develop educational tools that increase nat Native language literacy and provide cultural context and ecological information to all members of the community. Yeah, so we're, we're, we kind of come together and are co-developing this board game called Living Lands with Native teens and community advisors to try to strengthen some of these relationships beyond Kakamal and revitalize language learning in Auckland communities. And to do that, we're partnering specifically with the Phoenix Indian Center. Yes, we're really fortunate to partner with Phoenix Indian Center. It's a 75 years old organization now along Indian Steel uh, Road near Indian School. Um, and they help to develop a strong community by providing culturally based job readiness programs, drug prevention and intervention, as well as youth development programming and language cultural revitalization services, which is the main team that we work with. And we're excited to promote um, some of the upcoming events that they have like their powwow on, on April 15th. So you might ask, you know, why a board game? Uh, how, how are we going to answer all these problems in the format of a board game? Well, historically, unidirectional teaching strategies have often, like probably the ones you experience if you went to um, any sort of higher education system here in, in the United States, are formatted around a single educator or expert that disseminates knowledge to learners. However, reciprocal learning through mediums like collaborative gameplay, can encourage larger discussion around complex topics and promote a sense of belonging and reconnection with culture. It also allows everyone to be considered a knowledge holder, especially community elders, um, which are a rich source of knowledge sharing in many indigenous communities. And so by providing your lived experience, we can all be considered learners in these spaces and remove that hierarchical kind of dichotomous one has the power and the other group doesn't. Um, reciprocal learning both promotes collaboration and cooperation. And those are themes that are reflected in indigenous knowledge systems. Games can be participatory learning models um, that can be used in the classroom, but also around the dining table with families and among peers as multi-directional learning tools. So it really helps to escape that, you know, we need an institution or a certain space to, to learn new things or to share knowledge. This can be done anywhere. Narrative-based games also instill culturally relevant practices by recognizing the aid of storytelling as a way of sharing knowledge, traditions, and worldviews. Uh, game rules and formats can also be designed so that they are more accessible across generations and cultures. So it really promotes intergenerational gameplay and, and allows you know, diverse communities to bridge this discussion together. So Zoe and I kind of want you to sit for a moment and think, when was the last time you sat down to play a game? And what was the range of emotions that maybe came up when you played that game? Um, who did you play it with? And were you eager to play again and to share that game with others? And if so, what might that mean about the values you wanna share with your family, your peers and your community? So Zoe and the other game designer, Savage Creed Hess, use games to play with peers and colleagues in their free times. And they wanted to infuse biocultural learning about the river with the joy and play that the development of this game. Oops. <laughs> Go ahead, Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so we've been talking a lot about the game in the abstract, but let's talk about it a little bit more concretely, because uh, I think it's doing some pretty cool things. I have advice. So Living Lands is a board game about navigating the Salt River and its challenges, or, you know, the Onkakamel. In Living Lands, you play as some of the critters of the Onkakamel. So your goal is to survive and thrive together. And to do this, you have to navigate the board of food and water resources that represent the Onkakamel while trying to meet your needs. But there is a twist. You're really not the only ones who live here. The river itself is also an agent in the game. It's very much playing. And there are also other forces at work that are represented. Um, we use event cards to represent um, other like non-animal beings. So certain historical environmental events that have happened, whether result of humans or just natural disaster or um, 
just ecological processes. Um, so in our example here, we have uh, cattle grazing, or in this case, cattle overgrazing, which leads to the loss of a valuable food resources, just like as much of the arid west. Um, the grasslands that we have today do not look the same that they did 100, 200, 300 years ago. Many people don't really realize this because you look at a landscape and you think it's always been that way. <laughs> um, Living Lands also has um, some ecological stories to tell in the form of its, uh, it, it, it's the way that the, um, the player's animals are, are constructed. So they have abilities that are modeled after their ecological roles that they play. So Coyote, for example, her special ability is that she's an omnivore. She can eat both plants and meat. And then we have our friend Tarantula Hawk Wasp, who has an ability that lets him jump over nearby animals, which lets him move an extra speed each, each turn. And this evokes this kind of parasitic relationship with tarantulas, who are really often found near other animals. And Living Lands does some other things that are special too. You might notice that a lot of the art is in black and white, and this is because the, the, the game is very much designed to be printed out and played for pennies at your local library. <laughs> Accessibility across age, ability, income, and community lines is really, really, really important to us. So now we're kind of looking forward to developing the cultural learning components of living lands because we don't really have that that strength and background that um, we do with the ecology or with history. Um, so we've actually brought on a fellow undergrad, Arshon, who is a social ju justice and human rights major, and also a member of the top. The top eh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. She's also a member of the Tana Afa Nation. She has a lot of insight that we don't have, obviously, <laughs> as uh, people who have immigrated here or um, are part of settler ancestry here in the Salt River Valley. So she can tell us a lot about like where this thing is gonna really matter, where it's gonna do the best work. And fingers crossed, but we're thinking hopefully about exploring using this game as a language learning tool for the awesome language. Yeah. And the reason Zoe says, um, you know, fingers crossed or, or the way that we want to approach it is that we understand that not all communities are, are allowed to hear all the languages or some of the terms and kind of cultural narratives that are constructed in Indigenous communities. And even that certain words can't be said outside of certain sacred spaces. So we're really um, conscious of that. And that's why we partner so strongly with Phoenix Indian Center, as well as we think about um, Indigenous data sovereignty with our partner Alex Soto at the Labriola Mat. Amer Labriola National American Indian Data Center here at Tempe campus on um, ASU in the library, um, who's one of our, um, our partners along with the Office of American Indian Initiatives at ASU. So we really try and to develop our cultural advisory board through funding through the seed grant. And we wanna amplify community voices, especially from the Gila River Indian community and Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. We also wanna think about scalability because this story about dominant narratives crushing the historic narratives of indigenous people is not unique to just the Salt River, the Ongakamal. Um, this can happen in, and has happened in many places across our nation. So in terms of scaling this, it wouldn't be the content that traffic transfers, but rather the context of wanting to really break down and develop counter narratives um, and do that in a way that allows people to engage with the content outside of just being instructionally told, here's some new information about um, stories you haven't been told in, in the past. So we're hoping to foster new opportunities for Autham language learners to gather and practice speaking the language together, while also showing fundamental ecological concepts and local history through gameplay. So with the aid of the Season Moment Grant supported by Humanities Lab at ASU, we're now in the process of hiring our Board of Indigenous Collaborators. And we're really grateful to work with our new um, undergraduate student as well, who's gonna do core development and writing. Um, and lastly, we like to gift physical copies of the game to communities and educational institutions across the valley, valley though regardless, the game will always remain accessible and easy to print by anyone. Uh, there's also a feedback form link to our website if you use the QR code and do end up playing the game at home. Um, you'd be able to do so with your family members and provide feedback to us continuously because we think of this as an iterative and reflective process. So Zoe, I wanted to ask you a quick question. I think I'll just jump to our second one because we're short on time. But as an artist and ecologist, what have been some of the ways that you've grown while working in, with this team? So this is a fun one. Um, before I worked on this project specifically in the past, I had a web comment, which is actually about two Yavapai hydrologists getting up to um, quote unquote ghost shenanigans. And if you're at all familiar with Yavapai cosmology, you might realize that's a big no-no. <laughs> you don't talk about the dead. Um, there's a big taboo around talking about those who've gone before us. Um, so 
I, uh, I, I realized real quick, this is not going to work. I'm not the one who, who needs to be telling the story. And I put a, I put a can on that. Um, and I learned a lot in that process. And now in this, in this, in this project, it's really, I think, interesting for me to be in the position of like offering my skills and my, um, my, my, my positionality to other people so that I can help them do what they want to do, which I think is really important work. And it's often really overlooked and, um, underappreciated in the arts. <laughs> right. Thanks, Zoe. Yeah, we've had a great opportunity to have our own intergenerational discussion across um, the space. And I just want to congratulate her on giving the best undergraduate student presentation at the annual symposium. And um, to ask you all to join us at the Trace Rio Na Nature Festival this weekend for our next presentation to actually play the board game if you're interested. Um, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a rich presentation. Um, all right, the next uh, presentation is Taste of State 48. So uh, take it away, team. Okay, well, I'll, maybe I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Amber. Um, I'm Joan McGregor, I'm a professor of philosophy at Arizona State University and the faculty head there. And I work in um, moral, legal and political philosophy, but generally been focused on issues in climate justice and really thinking about these kind of intersectionality of climate, environmental, and food injustices. And that's where this idea of the syndemic really resonated of seeing, you know, populations being hit by all these, um, you know, a series of problems that really create, you know, and, and, and exacerbate each other. And so our project the other hat I wear is that I'm um, chair of Slow Food Phoenix, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but this project is a collaboration between ASU uh, faculty and uh, Slow Food Phoenix. So, um, and I, I guess, I think um, in the slide, there's a certain part where I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, Slow Food if you're not, uh, don't know anything about that organization. It's an international organization and we, we have a chapter here um, and so I'll say a little bit more about that, but I'm going to turn it over to Amber, who's got the, got the, got the, the slides here and uh, is going to tell us about this project. Thank you so much, Joan, and thank you to everyone for having us here. I've really enjoyed hearing all of your presentations, and I think you'll notice a similar theme with all of us. Um, but I want to welcome you to Taste of State 48 and invite you to explore Arizona's local, native, and seasonal food history. So let me tell you a bit about the project. What is Taste of State 48? Well, through the funding from this grant, we are producing the pilot of a 12 part documentary series, which will showcase the history, archeology span and culture of hyper-local indigenous and native foodways in order to educate the general public about Arizona's food. So like I said, Hi everyone, I'm Chef Amber Sampson. I'm a cultural anthropologist, food archeologist, and a member of the Slow Food Phoenix Board. And with me, I have Professor Joan McGregor, who is on the ASU faculty. She's also the director of Slow Food Phoenix for our chapter. And this is our research team comprised of, you will note, all members of the board of directors for Slow Food Phoenix. And we also have amazing local directors, videographers, and editors who are working with us. So I keep mentioning Slow Food. That's the nonprofit that brought all of this research together. And I'm going to throw it back to Joan so that way she can explain to you what is Slow Food. Okay. So um, if, if you're not familiar with the, the Slow Food organization, it was started in Italy really in response to fast food, right? Putting up uh, fast food, you know, outlets in, you know, historic uh, neighborhoods uh, with, with really long historical um, traditions in food. And it's grown into an, into an international movement that's focused on, as, this, as our slogan says, good, clean, fair food system. And so, um, so it's a big organization. We also have a, a, a Slow Food USA, which is a very robust group. And then there are local chapters and we're all kind of working at different scales <laughs> and different um, in different ways, trying to um, advance a better food system for everyone. 
Um, and there's a lot there. I hope you'll go and, you know, look at our website or look at Slow Food, you know, USA's website or the, or the international website. And you can see the scale of it. We have our leader now is from Uganda. Um, we really have a kind of international um, flavor to trying to better the food system. Um, but one thing that I did want to mention now, which I'm sure Amber will bring up, is that one of the, there's a lot of things that Slow Food does. Um, but one of its uh, signature kind of missions is what's called the Arc of Taste. And the Arc of Taste is a, oh, here we go, okay, um, is a way of trying to, as it says, it's kind of cataloging endangered heritage foods and kind of putting them on this arc as a way to showcase them and try to, you know, preserve those foods going forward. And um, it's a, it's really interesting if you go in there and see what, you know, all the different foods that are on there. And, it, and it's not, it's, it's, it's not static. We are still introducing foods all the time. These are the foods that are um, unique to Arizona that, um, uh, uh, that are on the Ark of Taste. Um, but we're, there are other ones that we'd like to get on there as well. But it's, <laughs> but it's a really interesting way of, of trying to, um, you know, take these, these historical or these heritage foods and, and make sure we don't lose them, right? As you probably know, we've lost many foods over the years. So I'm gonna turn it back to Amber because we, I know we're short on time. Well, Joan perfectly summed up Arc of Taste and I wanna reiterate that the documentary is based on this slow food Arc of Taste and each episode is going to follow a different food which is central to Arizona. And the Arc of Taste works to preserve these at-risk foods that are unique to each region. Arizona specifically has seven right now that have been boarded to the Arc to be preserved. Um, and our episode is going to be focusing on choya buds. Choya buds are an edible wild product. They're the bud of the choya cactus. And choya has been harvested for thousands of years by native communities in Arizona and throughout the desert. And what's so special about choya is that it grows only seasonally, sometimes for just two weeks in the spring. And it's just densely packed with nutritional benefits like being high in calcium and pectin, which help lower your blood sugar. And you'll note across the board, these local heritage native foods are really beneficial for preventing things like diabetes and heart disease. But what's the best thing about choya buds and all of the other Arc of Taste foods? They're delicious. So if you've never tried it, choya buds are a bright, zesty, kind of lemony vegetable. When they're cooked, it has a texture like an artichoke or an asparagus, and they're refreshing in a salad or soup. Choya are a great way for us to showcase what is important about seasonal and local foods, why local matters. And we bring this up because Arizona is home to the oldest history of agriculture in the United States. We know this thanks to recent archaeological research. With 4,000 years of documented Native American agriculture layered on top of Spanish mission era colonization, think cowboys, and then Chinese immigration and current modern food waves all come together to create the distinct layers of flavor that is Arizona's gastronomy. It's so central to the history of food in the United States that Tucson actually was recognized by UNESCO and became the first city of gastronomy in the U.S. because of these different layers of food. So from the local, we're able to answer more broadly distinct questions related to this endemic. We're able to see the way food for us, at least for me as a chef and researcher and the people on our team, is this universal language. And it's a tool that we use to answer life's big questions like supporting local, culturally appropriate food for different communities, native health and health of people who are impacted, um, local small farms, supporting our community, the economy through slow food, and bigger things like the drought, drought tolerant crops in our climate and water saving crops. So all of these big questions can really be answered for us through food. So what's the pilot of our episode look like? 
I want you to imagine that we're foraging on the land of the Akmal Atham people. Maybe we're walking right past the Salt River that you just learned about. And we're learning from Native community members, hearing their stories and their family traditions of harvesting this wild food, learning about the honorable harvest and collecting this food. And then we'll hear from nutritionists at ASU, the health benefits of consuming these local wild products. We'll head on to Tucson and hear about, and maybe even see 4,000 years of agricultural history at spaces like Mission Garden and San Xavier Co-op. And then we'll cook with local chefs these beautiful, brilliant, zesty, lemony choya buds. We'll bring this dish together and set it on a community table where we can all share, grow, and learn together. Each of us eating and supporting local one bite at a time. That's the one hour long pilot episode that we're working on, but why just tell you about it when I can show you a little clip, give you a little bite or a little taste of what you're going to be sampling in the documentary. Here's a clip from one of our partners, Nicholas Joe. he's Danae, and this is his choya bud enchilada recipe. And you'll note that everything in the dish is all local native foods, and this was prepared at the Mission Garden. Let me know if you can hear it. Yum, right? So that's one of the elements that's going to be part of the documentary. And all of these recipes and conversations come together to preserve the local, seasonable, and native food of Arizona. Right now, we're in the production process. We start filming tomorrow. And when everything has been edited and tasted a few times, we're going to have the debut of the pilot at ASU. And you're all welcome to join us sometime in the fall for a taste of State 48. I will throw it back to Joan if there's anything she wants to cover. And I want to thank you all for, for joining us. And if you have any questions or recipe comment cards, let us know. Thank you, Amber. Um, no, I don't think I got anything else. That's um, just, uh, <laughs> it's a great project. And uh, I think it you know, just this idea of teaching everyone, you know, what great, you know, heritage we have here with our native foods and that, you know, we should just be eating more of it, supporting our farmers. And um, that will, I think, help the problem with, with the water problem because a lot of these foods don't need a lot of water. And so, you know, it really is a kind of solution to this endemic that we're confronted with. So You could say it solves solves the problem on one big plate. <laughs> thank you so much thank you guys uh, what a delicious project <laughs> literally um all right last but not least let's look at uh let's hear from haikus transmuting ecological grieving into action so take it away team Okay, I, I can start talking while that's loading. So my name is Mary Fitzgerald. I'm a, a professor in the School of Music, Dance and Theater. And if uh, Barry Galena and Scott could take a minute and introduce yourselves, that'd be great. Okay, since you mentioned my name second, my name is Barry Moon. I'm uh, a associate professor in interdisciplinary arts and performance on the West Campus. 
Hello, my name is Galina Mihaleva, Associate Professor in Fashion, and the focus on my research is in the area of fashion design and wearable technology, blurring the line between fashion, science, and sustainability. And hi, friends, I'm Scott Fudier, um, Assistant Professor in the School of Sustainability, and my studies and work are at the intersection of sustainability and happiness. Great, thank you. So I just wanted to speak a little bit about the inspiration for this project. Um, haikus is a Finnish word that means simultaneous sadness and gratitude. And I started thinking about this project actually seven, seven years ago. I've been doing a lot of work around sustainability um, and I, came, I became interested in ideas around solastalgia or eco-nostalgia, which is a term coined by Glenn Albrecht. Um, and I had been thinking a lot about my own complex emotional responses to climate change and environmental destruction, and also about the responses of others, especially young people. Um, I see in my students quite a bit of eco-anxiety lately, or eco-depression, uh, concern about their future that's really affecting their mental health. And with everything else going on recently related to COVID and social justice, I feel like this anxiety keeps growing, especially in young people. Um, so I wanted to make a performance installation and community engagement project that explored some of these issues in a meaningful and artistic way, and more importantly, in a way that inspires action. So I think sometimes often our responses to environmental change can be, become overwhelming and paralyzing. And I wanted to create a work that not only examines the complexity of these issues, but also inspires action and a sense of optimism. So I connected with Scott because of his research around sustainability and happiness. Um, and he's given me a much fuller perspective on some of these ideas. And he's also given me a really different faith um, in the earth's ability to recover and to heal. Uh, and we've talked a lot about gratitude and how gratitude practices can cultivate our connections with the natural environment and with each other and with the body, with the spirit. Um, so he's really given me a much fuller three-dimensional perspective of this work. Um, we have, before I turn it over to him, we have already shown sections of this work. One was in the fall uh, with a group of ASU students. Another showing was in um, the summer, which just showed like sketches of the work. And now we're moving into the third section of the piece, which I'll talk about a little later. Beautiful, thank, thank you, Mary. Uh, and we're all gonna have a chance just to share our perspectives and what we contribute to the project. I was super excited when Mary approached me about this project because one of the reasons my background is engineering and I'm a farmer and regenerative developer and do things with permaculture and all kinds of traditions that I've learned, been fortunate enough to learn along the way. And I see in a lot of the work that I do that one of the things we're not very good at working with is our emotions. And we don't provide a lot of space for that in many of our institutions, including higher education. And so this project I see as an opportunity to create not only a physical space, but a ideation space or just a space that people can feel beyond just the physical space to have conversations and express parts of themselves. And in the work and research I do, I'm thinking often about how happiness is used as a tool against us uh, to bias us into thinking we're happy and making decisions that actually create a lot of the ecological challenges we see. And there are there is a lot of academic evidence now and non-academic evidence too that's showing that we are beginning to feel uh, a lot more stress and anxiety and we are starting to grieve the loss of our planet and the loss of our natural systems and the loss of our cultures and traditions which a lot of, which a lot of the talks before captured and and i feel like this is an opportunity to explore these things and to bring them into a physical space that we can then have conversations and creation from um, just advancing the slides here so just our team as we covered is, is mary galena barry and, and myself and we're all super excited to to be a part of this project uh, here's some of the creations that Kalina's been a part of, and you'll just see some of the pictures throughout the, the presentation as we go to. Uh, but I really want to ground us in our intention, you know, the intention of what this work is about. And this is part of the performance that went on in the fall, um, just getting ourselves kind of geared up into what this whole thing is going to look like and, and the experience as we go. Um, but it's 
it's really important to, to think about this project was really, it's really proposed to work directly at the interface of some of humanity's wicked problems, which are complex, challenging to solve and hard to fully understand. And one of the things that I say in sustainability a lot is that we're actually depressing people and, you know, we're making people feel apathetic and feel like there's not a lot of hope, but there are a lot of people out there on the ground, like the projects we saw today that are creating a lot of hope and are becoming motivated by the work that can be done. Um, you know, and at this intersection of wicked problems, we have all these different things here that are listed and it just sits this overwhelming reality that humanity is struggling to live in balance with ourselves, within ourselves internally, with one another as humans and more than humans, and also with our planet and just the cycle of, cycle of nature. Um, and as Mary said, haikus is translated from this word of a sense of simultaneous sadness and gratitude. And a lot of us are feeling the sadness and the gratitude can be hard when you're in the sadness. Uh, but there are lots of studies and, and non-traditional or non-academic studies or just ways old traditional ways of being that show when you are in relationship with your planet and the environment and you are grateful for all that provides it shifts your relationship with it um, and we really think the gratitude is a needed practice and so what we're really our intention is we're seeking to directly focus on these emotional responses to this intersection of wicked problems through artistic humanistic and scientific exploration so blending the science art and humanities and all four of us combined kind of bring this diverse perspective of meshing all these ways of being and knowing together uh, and bringing other ways of knowing and being too in some of our community events. And we're looking to transmute such emotions into action through the power of creative performance, visual design, community engagement, and outcomes, outcomes that seize the moment of shared ecological grieving. So we can look at the ecological grieving that we're experiencing now as something that shuts us down and puts us into a place where we feel apathetic and shameful and guilty and powerless or we can use this opportunity to look at the world around us and create what it is we'd like to create. And for me in this experience, and I'm sure my team members too, something like you're seeing here in the pictures is an opportunity to do just that. So we're just gonna go into our contributions real quick, what we both, what we all offer, all four of us offer, and then uh, we'll kind of weave it together at the end on what we're gonna be delivering. So Mary, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, um, so I'm the choreographer and this these photos you're seeing are of the last section the, the photos in the previous slides were of the first two that have been developed but we're continuing to develop and this is the new section which i'm thinking of as the green section where where uh, things start to transform um so there I'm, I'm looking at three sections in the choreography um, and they're all about three very distinct environments which maybe you saw in the previous slides one, I'm, I'm thinking of like an ice landscape, it, it kind of reminds you of that. The second one is more about the land. It has a lot of farming imagery in it. Um, in this third section, I'm thinking of the greening, the greening of the space, um, have, you know, exploring ideas of renewal, change. Um, one of the things Scott has also made me think about is this persistence of nature and, and you know, having faith in that, that it it's always going to transform and come back no matter how, what we do to it, even though we need, we still need to take responsibility for our, our actions. Um, and one of the things Scott did based on our conversation about somatics, which is something I teach uh, in music dance theater, is he created a, a project called the land story, which came from the body story, which I had told him about. So the dancers for this last section have taken the land story and sort of developed their own responses um, about particular locations. So each dancer in the last section, there are six dancers, by the way, and they're all collaborating with us on this. The, each of them will have a, their own solo or solos that are happening at the same time in these little nests that they build. Um, and this is kind of the earth revitalizing, coming back to us. So yeah, that's that's all I want to describe was that third section. So I can pass it on. Thanks, Mary and Galina. Okay, so um, I am absolutely honored to be on this project, to work with Mary. I worked with her and I always love it and appreciate it and also I worked with Barry and now I have the honor to work with you, Scott. And listening to your words, it's a challenge to me to come up with a um, costume that can relate to transformation and uh, optimism and definitely in the beginning of the emotional grief. So I thought of uh, using 
textile that it's made in very unconventional um, manner. This textile will be made with water-soluble material and inside will be embedded with particles from nature, from old clothing, embedding memories, emotions. And then uh, since we are talking about emotions and vulnerability, I would like to use also the human sweat, which will come from the dancers and the interaction between the water soluble material and the sweat will create this transformation in the costumes that they will enhance definitely the idea of transforming and changing. And then in the end, to bring that idea of optimism and the land renewal that Mary just mentioned and that she learned from Scott, I wanted to, which idea just came to me, to embed in the costume seats. And then after the last performance, the costumes can be planted into the nature. So something will grow back in the earth from those costumes being embedded with the memories um, from the dancers, their emotions. So something beautiful to, to create like a cycle starting from stage and going back to the land. So that's my contribution to the project. Thank you, Galena. And Barry, if you could just take a minute or so to cover yours, that would be great. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, part, my, my work in this project is on two different, in, from two different angles. One is that I work with uh, my partner Doug Nottingham, my partner in crime in a in a duo called Pin Cushioned. Um, uh, to create the music for the for the dance works, um, and I'm also working on the things that you see here, some installation pieces to include in, in as a kind of a pre-performance installation. Um, hopefully, things that the audience can touch that make sound. Uh, these are all most of the work is embedded with uh, microprocessors that produce sound, and um, yeah. That's some stuff to play with. Thanks, Barry. And then I bring in elements of, I've been fortunate enough to learn from uh, different teachers along the way that have taught me how to work with land and listen to land. And uh, I'll be bringing some of those elements and also my aspects of knowing how to farm. And then a lot of my interest now in my research is on altered states of consciousness. And so how can we take altered states into this work and see the world through a different lens and a different level of human understanding in relationship with nature and in reverence and reciprocal relationship to it. Uh, and then for our last part, just our proposed outcomes for the project. So, you know, we're really weaving together the disciplines of dance, music and design, technologies and sustainability science and research. And haikus will create collaborative experiences that honor our interconnectedness with nature and reflect on our shared responsibility to each other and to our planet. And so our proposed outcomes will involve a series of at least two public presentations at ASU's Fine Art Center in June 2023, aimed at artists, scientists, ASU students, and the wider public. We'll also create a short film and website to document the research process of bringing the outside nature inside into the performance space so people can feel that disconnect and that connection to meet individual human perspectives, many perspectives from many different levels. And then at least two public engagement workshops that explore the subject matter through management or movement investigation, rituals, writing, and spoken word activities. And that's both as an opportunity to collaborate and get more information and then share that. And then also participants in the workshop will be will have the opportunity to perform in a prelude to the performance that we'll have. And then our hope is to obviously present our research at national and international conferences. And I think that's it. Mary, did you want to add anything else? Um. Well, I hope you understood what the, from our discussion. So our whole idea is to create a performance installation. So we, we want to transform the space, kind of bringing the outside world in. Um, and the performances, um, we're thinking maybe 50 people would attend at a time, kind of being immersed in this space. Um, that's an intimate experience. And so we're hoping for three performances, two at least, but three so that if only 50 people can attend, um, we'd still have at least 150 who could who could be there in total. And we also want to keep the installation up for a couple of weeks so that people can also uh, go to that space. 
Um, I put in the chat here, my, I, I started a web page that's documenting our research. Um, there's a lot of photos on it and I'll add more from uh, Galena and Barry as we go. So yeah, you can look at that just for the future. So thank you. Thank you. Wow, incredible projects, uh, so inspiring. Um, let me see, oh, right, there we are, there we all are, hello. Um, thank you for sharing, these projects are just incredible. Um, a few things about the first few projects, I was really struck by the, the narrative link um, from narrative analysis, uh, data as narrative, refugee narratives, indigenous narratives, counter narratives is sort of this, this exploration of narrative. Um, and then the, the last two pieces, uh, really uh, the local uh, heritage um, place, uh, and then th this connection to the land, I was really struck by the, the idea of burying the costume after a performance uh, and that the, the costume regenerates itself. I think that's a very innovative and um, beautiful idea. Those are just some of my initial thoughts. Um, I'd love to hear now we have 15 minutes. Uh, if you have questions for each other or statements of meaning, uh, I would just open the floor, just ha raise your little hand signal um, and I'll call on you. Uh, and then we do have some questions from the um, looks like in the Q and A, but let's let's give questions or, or statements of meaning to each other um, if you would like to. Okay, I see uh, Joan has her hand up. Go for it. Uh, okay. Uh, wow, these are these are amazing. I was blown away by these projects. Um, so you know. I mean, it'd be great to sit down and really dig in, but um, I love the, the, you know, the, I'll start with the final one, the gratitude and sadness, what a great notion. And I think all of us who teach these topics are, you know, there's always this danger about talking about climate change because you don't want students to get just, you know, despondent that there's nothing that can happen, nothing that you can do. And so, you know, trying to, but on the other hand, you know, the, the idea of actually people connecting with their emotions about that really was really powerful. I, I hope, I, you know, I hope there'll be, a, your, your production will be at a time I can go, but anyway, uh, so I encourage you not just to do it in June, maybe you could do it also in the fall in case people are not in town at that time. Um, the other two, I wanted to just, just for self-serving reasons, I was thinking, I love the game. I, I love the art on the game. Oh, I'd love to have all that art, but, um, and I'd love to play the game. Um, but I wondered about layering food in there, you know, our, you know, the choya beans, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the peppers and, you know, in these different areas where things grow and, you know, might be another fun addition to, um, you know, and, and who eats them, and, you know, what animals eat them, what animals depend on them. Anyway, again, a little self-serving, um, uh, 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 adding, adding food to your, to your game. Um, and then I'll just say something quickly about the, the refugee. I, yeah, that, it's a little above my head <laughs> in terms of think. I mean, philosophers think a lot about AI, but in a little bit different way. Um, but I also, and I don't know something that I've been, and I haven't really, Amber and I haven't had, had a chance to talk about this much, but I, one, one thing that I think would be interesting if this show ever gets off the ground, we do the full, um, you know, uh, uh, story of food is to do refugee stories about food food they bring with them. Because I think one of the most meaningful things I ever heard is of these Iraqi um, refugees, the only thing they left with was their seeds in their pocket. That's the only thing they could bring. And, and just showing how food is so meaningful to people's identity that, you know, if you can't bring anything, that's what you're gonna bring, <laughs> right? So and again, uh, great projects, everyone. Yeah, that's very powerful. Um, all right, anyone else have a, within the presenters, a statement of meaning, something that resonated with you, uh, questions for another group? All right, well, I, um, as we were thinking, uh, I do have a question from the chat um, from Joy Young to the AI team. Uh, the question is, what does this community approval process look like? How do you select the group guiding these decisions? Do you account for intersectional identity within this approval model in some way? So I guess that's the question to the AI team. Um, 
again, and, and the question is in the chat if you want to look at it directly. Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll kind of bring bring this on. Um, so Sarah and I uh, uh, and and uh, have worked a lot uh, primarily um, in thinking about how to represent community uh, visions. Um, and so we're building on kind of a large process that we've developed developed over a number of years. A uh, little shameless plug, you should all check out the book Collective Wisdom that just came out on MIT Press, uh, where, where kind of the process has been uh, outlined a, a little more with, with some other uh, artists that we really like. So it's very nuanced. But if you think about the ways that we develop these type of things, I think that there's two major steps to think about. The first is to build a political awareness and partnership within the community. So what does that look like? It looks like us like reflecting on the issues that have to deal with AI and have to deal with their embodied um, uh, knowledge uh, that is really important. Uh, democratize the technology. Um, so it's not just uh, something that uh, is over anyone's head, right? So the, the con so to actually have dialogue in that, contextualize how the, the technology is going to be used, and then also empathize with the needs of uh, the any community that we work with um, uh, and develop uh, our, our uh, participatory uh, design process from, from that, that kind of basic point. And then after that, we kind of go through a very, very uh, uh, process that, you know, it's like the design thinking process where we co-define the issues we want to solve, co-ideate over how to do that, uh, co-prototype and work through the problems that exist within that prototype, particularly with AI, there's a lot of them. And then co-test, see how it works. Does it work? Does it not? Where are the breakdowns? Um, so we're really trying to like build on that model um, in general. Um, when you ask, I think, the follow-up question about intersectionality between identities, um, you know, we're, I think that that's something that, that is being negotiated and constantly contested within the group itself, right? So the group of people who are we're working with as collaborators all have different ideas of what it means to be a refugee. Um, and uh, the process of finding like a neat version of uh, unification of, of an idea or stance is really difficult. Um, so I don't think we're going to pretend to say that we can create some sort of perfect solve for that. However, the final versions of each of these AI bots are going to be incredibly subjective. They're based off of a single person's um, uh, uh, background. Um, and that is that subjectivity is very, very important when thinking about AI, uh, because AI will automatically try to broaden. Um, so what we're trying to do is the opposite. We're trying to narrow into an, an incredible singular human experience. So you can have that one-on-one -on -one there versus the speaking on behalf of a broad community that is refugee, because it's so diverse uh, that there's really no neat way uh, of being able to, to solve that. So that's some of our thinking. Um, and if there's any follow-ups, uh, or Sarah, you have anything to add? Just wanted to add that in terms of connecting with some of um, our co-creators, I'm going to pull from you, Joan, about sort of connecting with food and this project. A lot of it is actually eating together. And we've had dinners, whether that's a small group, a larger group, um, where we don't talk about the project at all. And it's really just connecting over common, common things like food, right? And so that's it's funny you bring that up because that has actually always been a big part of our work, um, and particularly with this project as well, which also makes it fun because then you get to share and have memories together before you actually start working on something as a group. Thank you so much. Um, any other responses or questions to each other? I, I have something if no one else uh, does. I'm really struck by the term eco-nostalgia which is a, it resonates specifically with the project I'm working on in terms of um, this uh, climate grief and, and how you transform climate grief into climate action. Because I do feel that the scope and scale of the climate crisis is so huge that it can be paralyzing, that it just, it, it, it's so big that it turns to apathy. So I think artists have to navigate that, um, that fine line between uh, uh, 
ringing the alarm bells, but we also, there's got to be some level of hope, uh, but it also can't be all just happy ending because it's not necessarily a happy ending. It's unless action is taken. So I, I thought that the term persistence of nature was really powerful as well. That And how do we fit in? Because nature will heal itself. Nature, the planet will heal itself. This is whether we're able to be on it with beyond the planet yeah. with nature. Uh, and, and there's, you know, over and over, it, the planet has proven, look at Chernobyl, it's a thriving forest now. Um, so anyway, that, that that's one other thing that struck me. Um, all right, we have four minutes left. So anyone else would like to respond to any of the provocations? Rachel, I see Sally has her hand yeah. up. Oh, hey, Sally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I I want to respond really in a general way um, as someone who's uh, helped make the decisions on funding these projects and so happy that we were able to include so many in our last funding cycle. But I think we're witnessing some advantages of uh, these kinds of exchanges. First of all, the teams are amazing. I mean, when you see the kinds of expertise that are coming together that really don't have an opportunity to come together very much uh, in normal research environments. And so I believe these projects just demonstrate the richness of providing these opportunities. And I also think you're seeing the benefits of intergenerational collaboration, uh, Zoe's uh, contributions are fantastic. And there are an awful lot of situations where students don't get to play a role in faculty research, uh, narrowly defined. So again, these seed grants are kind of making history and I'm so, so pleased about that. And finally, the benefits of just sharing uh, the work that people are doing, even though you're coming from very different places, the the kinds of interactions that happen among you um, are really important. And so Joan's uh, discussion about food in relationship to other projects is a perfect example of what it means to come together, even with people you wouldn't necessarily pick uh, to come together with, that we that ste stepping outside of our research boxes really opens up activities and areas of inquiry. So I just wanted to be able to point that out that um, Seize the Moment as a project uh, is very proud of having been able to offer this opportunity uh, to scholars and students. Thank you, Sally. Actually, Brianna, can I say one last thing before you jump in there? Oh, I will say as a previous recipient of the Seize the Moment grant, it was through this interaction where we heard about other people's projects that led to our collaboration with the Turn It Around project, and now we're actually collaborators. Uh, so we might start as, as your single project that then connects to other projects and then become the sort of light, larger rhizomatic network of interesting projects. So, um, and there's lots of crossovers. That that was a wonderful outcome of the, the seed grant for, for our project. So Brianna, take it away. Yeah, um, I, I just really, um, really quickly, I want to say for the um, AI team, I do want to say Joy had to jump off and let me know, um, but it's going to come back later and watch the response. Um, I'm sure they're going to be very excited about what you had to say. Um, and uh, Joy is actually a storyteller. And so I have a feeling that I'll, if you all are interested, they would like to connect. Um, they let me know that they're really interested in the um, linguistics tie in uh, to your project as well. So that was just um, interesting. Um, and overall, I just want to say um, thank you to you all for, for being here today. And um, I'm really excited. We have this, it's been recording. So I'm going to make sure that um, anybody who registered who didn't make it today will get a copy of this, as well as it's going to go on the Leonardo Laser YouTube channel. Um, and then we'll be sharing this out in other ways as well. Once it's on the Leonardo Laser YouTube channel, I welcome you all to share this and, you know, um, show people your wonderful projects. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And I want to I want to echo Sally's sentiment about um, how Seize the Moment does this and brings people together and Rachel's sentiment about creating those relationships to help boost your projects and as you move forward. Um, so 
Thank you all for being here. I hope you're all going to go take a little break, have a little lunch. We talked a lot about food. I know I got hungry. Um, and if there's any way I can support you, please let me know. Um, and to any participants, if you have further questions or anything you need from me, please let me know as well. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. Thank Thanks, you, Bree. Everyone. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Oh, thank you. Nice to see you, Galena. <laughs> nice thank, to you. See you Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.